To most experts, there is a distinction between poltergeist activity and phenomena usually associated with a haunting. Parapsychologists like to differentiate between hauntings and poltergeist. Hauntings are traditionally location-focused, whereas poltergeist is traditionally person-focused. The other difference is hauntings can go on for years, for decades, for even centuries, whereas poltergeists are traditionally very, very short-term. So they may be a few weeks, months, and in rare cases, leading up to a year or longer. And that's why the Enfield Poltergeist is so special, because it's about 14 months in length. By the 4th of September, and near breaking point, Mrs Hodgson again turned to the Nottinghams. Not knowing what else to do, they called in the press. No one will be able to convince me that there wasn't something very odd in that house. Things would just happen. You walk in the house, things would just take off, fly around, flip over, do this, do that. of the 4th of September 1977, a call was taken at the Daily Mirror, recounting almost unbelievable activity at the home of Peggy Hodgson and her children in Enfield, North London. The, the night news editor was um, a great character uh, called Tom Merrin, and the phone kept ringing with the Nottinghams, um, who were living next door to the Hodgsons. And Tom tried to get rid of it in the usual way, which is uh, fairly short, but Vic Nottingham uh, kept ringing back. Convinced by the Hodgson's plight, reporter Doug Bentz and photographer Graham Morris were dispatched to the Hodgson home. We knew nothing about the story at all. We were just told that there was something going on in a house in, in Enfield. And I knew the area pretty well. I'd been at school there. So I, I knew all around there. And we found the street pretty easily. And we went into the Hodgson's, met them. And they were clearly in a right old state, the family. But newspaper people are very skeptical and they were clearly very distraught, but nothing happened at all. According to Playfair's book, This House is Haunted, as the newspaper men were leaving, the activity picked up again. We came out of the house, we got in the car, and then Vic came running out and we went back in. Yet photographer Graham Morris remembers things a little differently. The mother and young children had been taken into the neighbour's house and were being looked after there. The whole point was that we were to go in first and, and wait for the family to come in. And it was as the family were then brought in, the children were brought in, some of them still asleep, then suddenly things started flying out around the room and, and things were taking off, only little things, you know, things like children's uh, toys, Lego bricks, stuff like that. Regardless of which testimony is correct, both newspaper men agree on the bizarre offence which followed. The two girls were screaming. I hesitate to use the word paranormal. Something was, something was going on there and Graham was hit by a brick and Lego bricks hit the wall. And I, I, you know, I have no doubt that that happened. I'm just concentrating on photographing it. I wasn't really that worried. There were things that were just bouncing off walls or flying around. And, uh, and then suddenly a, a Lego brick on a, you know, it's quite a sharp corner on a, on a Lego brick whacked me in the, in the eye, eyebrow and uh, left a mark there for a few days. Um, lucky it didn't hit me in the eye. These photographs were taken around the time of Morris being struck. It, it, was, it was quite weird, it was quite upsetting, it was um, disturbing to be in there because certainly if you've got no answer to anything. You've got no reason to, um, for any of it to, to have happened. You know, it's not logical. They could have, of course, been flicked by somebody, but the position of the people and the, the force of the brick and the angles were wrong. I could see it as if it were 
yesterday, I could see the people in the room, and no one would be able to convince me that there wasn't something very odd in that house. A senior reporter at the time was so impressed with what Bentz and Morris told him that he followed up the story himself the very next day. We couldn't offer the services to deal with this. We, had, we didn't have the facilities. Or we could get the story and we could get photographs, but we couldn't do anything else. There was growing concern amongst senior Mirror reporters for Mrs Hodgson's well-being. In an attempt to aid the situation, they called the Society for Psychical Research, the SPR. The Society for Psychical Research was set up in 1882 to in investigate uh, those faculties of man, real or supposed, that are not explicable on any generally recognised hypothesis. It doesn't have any fixed ideas or opinions, and anyone can be a member whether they actually believe in paranormal phenomena or not, but of course obviously most of us do, do are convinced that there is some reality in these things. The SPR assigned the case to one of their members, Maurice Gross. Maurice, who unfortunately passed away uh, summer 2007, uh, was an inventor. When the Enfield Poltergeist case started, Maurice Gross was kind of a fledgling investigator. But he went into the case uh, actually with a very objective uh, mind. He initially interviewed the entire family and was always thinking about alternative explanations and questioning everything. It's interesting to see a guy turn up with a handlebar moustache looking like a you know, World War II fighter pilot and uh, driving an E-type Jag and then being there for the Society for Psychical Research. You, you don't think that the two <laughs> go, to, go together. He went out of his way to befriend the family. He was not after an easy, quick, um, you know, an easy, quick answer. Despite his level-headed approach, Gross was soon convinced the phenomena was genuinely paranormal. Not long after arriving at the house, he himself was witness to strange occurrences. Lego bricks were being thrown, marbles were being thrown. Morris observed that, um, that the marbles, when they landed on the floor, they didn't actually bounce, they just stopped dead. Uh, but then things started to escalate a little bit more. It was things like, you know, the furniture was being hurled around. Uh, the three-piece suite, I think, was even overturned at one point. Another chair gone over. The red, the red chair turned over backwards. Anybody on it? Yes, yes, yes. He was like this on it. Jenny was sitting on it at the time we were thrown over backwards. But each stage in the Enfield Poltergeist case, you've got uh, witnesses from very different backgrounds being brought in. Initially, it's the neighbours and then it's police officers, and then it's newspaper reporters, and then it's Society for Psychical Research investigators. You understand that you really shouldn't be in this house. You do understand you shouldn't be in this house. You do. That was, again, two knocks. There was knocking in the house. The kids weren't anywhere near it at the time, so it wasn't them. We knew they, it wasn't them. If you'd taken it out of context, if, you'd, if that had happened in your own home, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have worried about it at all. But the fact that it, it happened there and you're surrounded by 16 people from the Society of Psychological Research and there are cameras and all the rest of it, you think, this knocking must be important. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Are you having a game with me? Ah! Are you having a game with me? Oh, right. Oh, perhaps. Oh, I as I ask the, as I ask the question, are you having a game with me? It threw, it threw the the cardboard box and the pillow right at my face. That was a very strange house, and something very strange was going on there. We're all standing this side of the room, and over that side of the room, that drawer has just opened on its own in that cabinet. Now, how do you explain that? You can't. So that that was worrying, as far as I was concerned.